Evil does have a face. The bullets that cut him down. It's a devastating blow. Maybe like this. Took more than his life. There's another manner of death circled here. It's homicide. They left a family shattered. Full of rage. Is there a killer loose? You, know, you don't know. Is there a killer loose? And a team of relentless investigators scrambling for clues. Scenario didn't fit. There's more to the story. A lot more. I'm Tony Harris. In my 30 years as an investigative reporter, I've learned that every crime reveals a world of trouble. A family, a neighborhood, an entire town changed forever. Come with me to the scene of the crime. When a good, hard-working family man is murdered, it leaves a scar on those around him. On his wife and children. On his community. And on every cop who works the case. On January 20th, 1992, Billy C. White's death cut deep. And tore his family apart. I've come to Kenston, North Carolina, the gateway of the South, to find out who killed Billy White and why. I know just who to start with. His eldest daughter, Teresa Murray. Describe this man in this photo. That's a young Billy C. <laughs> That's what everybody called him, Billy C. They called him Billy C? Mm -hmm. Me and him were very close. He was a good dad, good provider. Teresa was 16 when her parents divorced. Life moved on for Billy. There was a lot of us when he remarried. He married a lady, Sylvia White, that had three children. My dad had four children. So you're talking a lot of kids in one house. What is your favorite memory of your father? Just seeing him, talking to him. I just miss him every day. And it's been a long time since he's been gone and it still hurts. In 1992, Teresa received the call that would change her life forever. I answered the phone and it was Sylvia. She says my daddy did not come home that night. Why would Billy, a popular man, just 59 years old, suddenly go missing? Sylvia went to police headquarters to alert assistant chief Speedy Ingram. How would you describe his wife's demeanor? When Sylvia White came in the police department and told us her husband was missing, she was very upset, hysterical, crying. I said, wait for the day. We'll see if he shows back up home. The next day, she came back to the police department, still crying, saying he did not show up. I took a report as a missing person. Missing person report here. This is, there you go, 7.42 in the morning. This is January 21st, 1992. And he was driving a burgundy Chevy Lumina. Correct. Sylvia White made a statement that he had gone to Jones County, Trenton area, to sell a personal insurance policy, but had not returned home. What do you think when you get this information from her? In my mind, maybe he had an accident. And if we got in the air, we could maybe find his vehicle. So we get to the airport, get a plane, and, and start looking.
I called the police chief and said we had found Billy White and it appeared that he'd been murdered. I asked him to send detectives to the crime scene. Strange place to have a business meeting. Was it so remote by accident or by design? Speedy and his team called in the heavy hitters to handle the case, the State Bureau of Investigation. Agent Kenneth Raper was on call that day. When you get to any crime scene, what's your role? I like to walk through and just kind of get an idea about what I've got. Sure. Do whatever's got to be done to help locate the evidence and then put the perpetrator at the scene. Can you get here? What do you see? The road forks. Mm -hmm. You got one portion that bears off to the left, and the other one kind of bears off to the right and makes a little hard right back that way. Yeah. Could you see the body from here? No, you couldn't see anything from here. Okay. But as soon as you rounded the corner, you could see Mr. White and his vehicle. What could you tell looking at his body? His pockets were pulled out. It looked like a robbery. Like he had met someone here, things went bad, they killed him, and then robbed him. There were no weapons there, there was no shell casings, but immediately you could see he had been shot with a shotgun. In this portion of his chest right here, close range, it was a devastating blow. Distance maybe, maybe like this. Right there? Possibly. Hits him in the chest? Yes. And then in his lower left side, he was shot again. There's a second shot. Yes. I figured the suspect broke it down, took the shell out, put it in his pocket, put another one in, and then walked over to Mr. White and then shot him again. Billy was dropped on the spot, taken by complete surprise. So why did his robber have to shoot him twice? Time to dig deeper. I need to see the clues for myself. This is the shirt that was removed from Mr. White that he was wearing the day that he was killed. Oh. This is the collar of the shirt, and this right. is the wound. These are the pellets that were removed from Mr. White's body at the autopsy. These have some real weight to them. Yeah, a lot of weight. They do a lot of damage. One shot would have been enough to take Mr. White's life. One shot would have been enough. That says it all. This can't just have been a robbery gone bad. Someone wanted Billy White dead. This was a hit. Is there anything that leads you in the direction where you think you might find a suspect? No, sir. We're still in the dark, but now we're starting to gather evidence and put it together. We got to talk to family members, right. associates, employees of the insurance company. Beat the bushes, so to speak. In the dead of night, in the middle of nowhere, who was Billy meeting? I go talk to Sylvia, and I asked her who was the guy that Billy was going to meet to sell the... Uh, insurance policy too. Sylvia White said her husband went out to sell an insurance policy and he doesn't come home. Yes, sir. She told me he was supposed to meet this guy out in the county. He's supposed to have been a big time farmer that wanted to buy a large insurance policy. Did you ever get a name? Yes. Tim Connors. Tim Connors. Was he the last person to see Billy White alive or the first one to see him dead? Beloved father, friend, and fixture of the community, ruthlessly gunned down on a deserted dirt road. Details are light, and the pressure's heavy for Agent Eric Smith of the State Bureau of Investigation. I'm the new guy. You're the new guy. I did not think I would get the opportunity to investigate that case uh, with Mr. Billy Hoy. And one of the things that touched me, I realized about a year and a half earlier, 
I'd been working undercover, and I'm bearded, I'm gungy, I'm dirty. And uh, this gentleman walks by, and he says, do you want to stick a chewing gum? Well, the individual that did that was Billy White. There was a bit of a personal connection. There was. Billy White had a heart. He was a kind man. And it didn't matter who you are or what station in life you were in, he was compassionate toward it. Here's a person that was liked by 99% of the population. That means no leads, no suspects. So who do you look at? There is a name that surfaces. Tim Connors. Yes. Tell me how that name becomes the target of the investigation. Billy White's wife, Sylvia White. She remembered getting a call from an individual who wanted to take out an insurance policy. And she said he had scheduled a date to meet on a log road in Jones County. The first thing I had to do was find out if, in fact, we had a Timmy Connors within reasonable proximity of this area. Let's see. And as we go through DMV records, uh, could not find a Timmy Connors listed for the Jones County area. Couldn't find one for surrounding areas. So I went through every hotel in eastern North Carolina for a Timmy Connors staying there during the week preceding Billy White's death and the week after. And you're coming up with what? Zilch. Zero. I'm going back to the family to find out more about their past. What secrets could they have been keeping? The eldest son from Billy White's first marriage is Dan White. Sylvia was my stepmother. What do you remember about your mom, your birth mom? She was sick. She had um, mental illness. One day, they took my mother out in a jacket and that was the last time she was at home. How would you describe the period of time after your mom is institutionalized and it's just you, your siblings, and your dad trying to make it? It was a difficult period. What man marries to have his um, spouse become sick and have to leave their children. I just think the uh, pressure uh, that he probably put on himself was more than what anyone else would expect of him. But Billy C. got a lifeline from a neighbor, a widow herself. Sylvia lived just down the street with her three sons. What do you think your father so in Sylvia. A provider, a caregiver. He married someone to help raise his children. He married Sylvia thinking she would be a good wife and mother to his children. Yeah. What's the makeup of your family at that time? Sylvia had three. There was four of us. It was a stepladder. Teresa, Jeff, me, Steve, Tony, Todd, and then little Bill. What's your reaction to the news that your dad is dead? He didn't just die. You know, had he been at the hospital and we were anticipating it, um, I could have been prepared for it. But by the way it was done, I delayed grieving because of the shock instead of the normalcy to death. There was nothing normal about Billy White's death. Hard as investigators were working to bring justice for the family, was it enough for Teresa? I was in a state of, I don't know what you call it, shock, I guess, because nobody said a bad word against my dad. 
three to four hundred people they interviewed is what the police told me and nobody had an unkind word it was just who knew who and why killed billy white so if they're after him they could be after his daughter or, you know, is there a killer loose you know you don't know is well, there I didn't... a killer loose right do you remember the point at which it begins to feel like you're running out of leads you're running out of information Mm-hmm. and they could find tim connors Couldn't ever find him. Tim Connors was going from being a promising lead to a dead end. And the White family was getting desperate. A poster created offering a reward. $11,000 for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the person or persons involved in the murder of Billy Carlisle White. What were your hopes for this poster? That it would help bring someone in that knew something. Because we had no clue why Billy White was dead. But someone did. If a tip did come through, I know who'd get the word. Standing by with no one to prosecute was the assistant district attorney, Greg Butler. There's a point at which this case could go pretty cold, right? It was very cold, and they were, they were working feverishly, but no, no matter how good their the job that law enforcement does, sometimes you need to get lucky. You need something to break loose to give you a chance to move forward. Did law enforcement get that break? They did. A confidential source contacted law enforcement and was able to say that a person had been looking for a hitman. Just when the investigation has hit a wall, just when the mystery of Billy White's brutal murder seems unsolvable, the case gets a jolt of adrenaline, a tip according to Assistant District Attorney Greg Butler. A confidential source contacted law enforcement and was able to say that a person had been looking for a hitman. Well, this is interesting here. The confidential source of information says in this phone call that this person had planned this for over a year. That's correct. Did all of this information check out? The gist of the information checked out. Law enforcement was able to determine the person was James Linwood Taylor. Agent Smith with the SBI, along with some of the Sheriff's Department detectives, asked him to come in to be interviewed about his involvement in this murder. Eric Smith told me that at the time, he was new to the force. Now his first big murder case was hanging on one thing getting the truth out of Taylor. What did you know about James Linwood Taylor before this tip came in identifying him? We knew he had been a biker, okay? Uh, I had worked this area some, and I knew he had been involved a bit in the marijuana trade okay. uh, in the area. Lenore County Sheriff's Department picked him up and brought him here for an interview. As a matter of fact, you're seated where Mr. Taylor would have been. I kind of inflate his ego when I come in. I really need your help. There's a murder, I'm sure you've heard about it. We're trying to find out how it occurred, what happened. Do you know anything about these people? Taylor furiously denied any part in the homicide. He was so sure of himself, he agreed to take a polygraph test. He took the examination, and what did you hear from the examiner? There was deception indicated. I can bring him in now and break him down. Look, it's game time. We've had fun, but you're lying. Why'd you lie to me? I treated you with respect, with dignity, and you lied to me. At that point, you see the look of shock on his face. But it's a chess game. I even let him leave and uh, get a sandwich. I said, man, you know, go ahead, take a break, leave. And he did. 
walks the hallways for a while. And uh, he comes back in. And he said, uh, I did it. I shot him. I asked him, how many times did you shoot him? And he says, uh, I, I, it was once. Boom. Eric had caught Taylor in a lie. Billy White was shot twice. Scenario didn't fit. Even though he said, I did it, you weren't 100% sure that he was even being truthful in that statement. Correct. There's more to the story. A lot more. Two shots. Whoever the gunman was, he wouldn't have gotten tripped up on that detail. So what happened when Agent Ken Raper dug deeper? These were items of evidence that we recovered from the burn pile that was in Mr. Taylor's backyard. This is the brass portion of the shotgun shell that they recovered from the ashes in Mr. Taylor's backyard. It had been a pretty good sized fire. Linwood Taylor collects they burned. the shell casings. He takes them back to his house and he's gonna burn the evidence. That's what he's thinking. But metal's not gonna burn completely up and that's the other shotgun shell. Two shots at the scene. So you got two brass portions of the shotgun shell. Two shells after all. There was more. He confessed what he did with the murder weapon. He took apart the shotgun, sawed the barrel into several pieces and placed it into a plastic bucket. Put some men in it and tossed it into the Noose River. We put the dive team in the river and located it in a five-gallon plastic bucket with the barrels in it. Picked it up and placed it into the boat. And what we have here is going to be the portions of the barrel that the lab actually chipped out of the cement. Taylor's shotgun was a 32-inch 12-gauge. That's a whole lot of rifle. Agent Raper could tell from the position of Billy's body that he was caught by surprise and dropped in his tracks. It's hard to believe Taylor could pull that off, keeping such a big gun hidden from sight. Sounds to me like he was really trying to hide something from investigators. But what? When Linwood was confronted with the facts, he came clean about what his involvement was. He initially said he was the one who was the trigger person. He did admit later that that was not the case. Linwood Taylor issues a statement that implicates this Ernest Baisden. Who is Ernest Baisden? Ernest Baisden was the trigger man. They brought Ernest in and spoke with him, and ultimately he confessed. It turns out Taylor got cold feet about committing the murder and enlisted his uncle Ernest. So there were two hitmen. But then who hired them? Why would Linwood Taylor, why would Ernest Baisden want to kill Billy White? Let me show you Baisden's statement. Linwood Taylor come by my shop one day and said he had this girl that wanted him to kill her husband and I told him it was a crazy idea and kind of passed it off. That's correct. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Sylvia White. Sylvia White. Billy's wife. Is she the real culprit in this cold-blooded murder? James Linwood Taylor, arrested for the murder of Billy C. White. His uncle, Ernest Baisden, confesses to pulling the trigger. But in a stunning twist, Baisden claims there's a third conspirator, Billy's own wife. We've got an arrow here, and it's starting to point in the direction of Sylvia White. 
Exactly. Wait a minute. He's trying to deflect culpability. You're skeptical of this when you're hearing this from, from this clown, aren't you? There is any kind of skepticism of anybody, but as we begin to look into his statements, Father, pieces just come to light that corroborated what he was saying. This is Assistant Special Agent Eric Smith's statement where he's sharing Bayesden's statement to him. That's correct. On the date of Billy White's death, he had ridden with Linwood Taylor in a cutlass automobile. They sat and waited. Billy White pulled in and got out of his van. Mr. Taylor shook Mr. White's hand and introduced himself as Timmy Connors, at which time Taylor said he had to go pee. Mr. Bayston went down to the ground where they had placed a shotgun. Bayston pointed the shotgun at Mr. White. Mr. White never blinked. He never flinched. He never tried to run. He fired the first shot, and Mr. White went down. Mr. Bayston approached him and removed the expended shell discharged the weapon once again on Mr. White as he was down on the ground. Sylvia was the mastermind. She came up with a plan to lure her husband out in the middle of nowhere. She concocted a man by the name of Tim Connor. said he called and needed life insurance and wanted to meet with Billy White on an old logging road. Sylvia knew Billy would go because he'd go to the, the gates of Hades if he thought he could make a sale. What did she promise Linwood Taylor in order to get him to go through with this? $20,000 in cash that would come from Billy White's life insurance policy. But for you to take Linwood Taylor seriously, you've got to take his statement and you've got to corroborate it. That's correct. How do you do that? Betrayal can leave a trail of blood. You just have to follow it, step by step. Were Taylor and Bayesden in lying about Sylvia? The investigator who had to now find out was Agent Eric Smith. So this is the statement Linwood Taylor gives to you. Taylor says, she said, you're going to think I'm crazy, but I'm looking for somebody to kill my husband. Correct. He said he was kind of shocked, and he kind of squirmed a bit. And she looked at him, and she said, well, if you can't do it, I'll do it myself. She explained to Linwood Taylor. She tried to poison Billy White. We found out that intermittently throughout the past two years, Billy White would get ill and he'd get his health back. It'd be another two months. He'd become ill and he'd get his health back. She explained to Linwood Taylor she tried to poison him. That's in Taylor's statement here? Yes, sir. Wow. I'm serious. I, I, I want you to know I'm serious. I have some pages here that I went to the library and I found a book on poison. She showed me the pages. Taylor says to you, Sylvia says to me, I've been trying to poison my husband. Yes. You can't prove that, can you? Smith sure hoped he could. Here in the library, I go to the shelf, and sure enough, there's poisonous plants in North Carolina. I placed it on its spine so I could examine it, and as fate would have it, it fell open. The area it fell open to is where missing pages were located. And the content of the pages that have been ripped out were poison hemlock and poison sumac. 
plants that you would commonly find on the roadsides of North Carolina. I immediately submitted the book to the lab. And a couple hours later, the lab calls me back and says someone had placed a palm here and torn the pages from the book. Guess what? We've got Celia White's palm print. 55-year-old Sylvia White looked like a kindly mother. Now she was the face of a black widow killer. Imagine the shock of her stepchildren, Billy's kids, especially the youngest, Stephen White. a four-year-old that died. Our brother, Little Bill. Little Bill? Who's Little Bill? I see a younger, fourth sibling in family photos from 1973. Someone frozen in time. Little Bill's my best friend. I always played with him on the floor with his toys. What do you remember about the day he died? I remember I was standing at the garage. My dad pulled up. He got out of the car, came around the back. He was crying and said, there's been an accident. I said, where's little Bill? He looked at me and said he didn't make it. Sylvia said that she had came home from the cleaners, told little Bill, don't mess with this bag. She closed the door, came back out, and he was on the floor choking on the plastic. When my dad was killed, me, Teresa, Dan went to the police department, all of us at the same time. Well, you know, little Bill died you know, 20 years ago, and, and that's, everything started clicking, you know. Did you think Sylvia had something to do with little Bill? At that Bill's point, death? you didn't know. But we wanted to find out. Sylvia White is facing charges in the murder of her husband. But what if he wasn't actually her first victim? That's the question I want to ask retired medical examiner, Dr. John Butts. What do you remember about the facts that were brought to you uh, about this particular case, the death of, of Billy White Jr.? The death had uh, been investigated and deemed to be an accident but now in light of additional information about uh, stepmother, law enforcement were coming to us for our uh, input on that. Then I recommend that the body be exhumed and examined. Did you do that in this case? Yes, sir. What I did was remove the bones and examine them very carefully to see if there was evidence of other injury on the child. We did find evidence of older injury specifically a fracture of the base of the skull. We knew that this was an injury that had happened weeks before the child had actually died. Should the injury have been treated? Yes, sir. The amount of force necessary to fracture a skull in that fashion would have caused a lot of pain, potentially even rendered the child unconscious. Is there enough evidence at this point to suggest there is some negligence surrounding this child's care? We're certainly concerned uh, about the uh, circumstance surrounding the, the death itself, knowing the ways in which children choke to death on objects. This didn't match. 
This is the statement from one of the nurses in Billy Jr.'s care. She stated that the plastic that came out of the baby's throat was approximately as big as the palm of her hand. It wasn't even visible when they looked into the child's mouth. It was all crammed down into the back of his throat. And that would not be something that the child would do, or, or for that matter, probably could do. There's another manner of death checked and circled here. homicide. Billy White Jr. was murdered. Those were the conclusions I drew. Sylvia White now faced two trials. The first, second degree murder and conspiracy for the 1992 shooting death of her third husband, Billy Carlisle White. And the second, toddler died 20 years ago, death report now reopened. But what if there were even more? The Lenore County Sheriff's Department is also investigating the June 18, 1967 death of Sylvia White's then-husband, Leslie Ipoc. What? Died June 18, 1967 of an apparent suicide, brain damage inflicted by a 22 caliber pistol. Why someone would kill it's hard for most of us to understand. But for someone who's killed once, it may come easy to once again.
Before she married Billy Sr., there was Leslie Ipot. I found his brother, Douglas. There's a picture of him and her. And there's Sylvia. And there's Sylvia. Was there an investigation into your brother's death? No. What's your gut feeling about this? My gut feeling was she had something to do with it. When they investigated Billy's death, Eric Smith got a tip that she may have been trying to experiment with some natural poison. There was a period of time that Leslie had been in the hospital with numbness in his limbs. Leslie allegedly possibly come in contact with some type of poison. That leads me to think that Leslie's death may not be suicide. Heaven knows I could be wrong. And if I was wrong, I hope the Lord will forgive me for it. But uh, I believe, I believe she done it. Do you believe Sylvia White killed her brother? Yes. A case that has rocked Lenore County has finally come to trial. Ernest Baisden, Billy White's trigger man, was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to death. James Linwood Taylor pled guilty and received a life sentence. After four years of court battles and 20 years of anguish for the White family, a Martin County jury has delivered a verdict. Sylvia White was found guilty of first-degree murder in the slaying of her stepson, Billy Jr. Miss White maintains her innocent, but to avoid the death penalty, her lawyers advise her to plead guilty to one count of second-degree murder and one count of conspiracy to commit murder. Sylvia is serving two consecutive life sentences. Leslie Ipock's death is still officially a suicide. Why did Sylvia do it? Prosecutors had their theories. From the life insurance she stood to collect to being tired of mothering. But for the White family, what possible explanation could bring closure? Why it happened to my family, I have no idea. This evil woman came in our midst and destroyed our family. When you think of Sylvia White now, you're shaking your head. I try not to think about her. I'm ready for her to die. And rot. And go to hell. Wouldn't shed a tear. At all. Probably be able to get some closure. And then I could probably make some peace with things. Full of rage. Can't stand her. And I understand his pain. And I understand their pain, but we all have our own level of pain. My peace required me to forgive her. In order for you to have peace in your life, I had to forgive her. I hurt for Steve because I see the pain he's in. I don't hurt for me. This hurts me. It shouldn't happen. It shouldn't happen. I won't him to have the kind of peace he deserves. We've all dealt with it different, or tried to deal with it, still dealing with it today. And we'll always stick together, but we have to do it in our own ways. Evil 
does have a face. And the sooner we realize what evil looks like, the sooner we can identify it and help other people recognize it in their lives. We know what evil looks like. Coast, now I'm in the East Coast, sorry.